welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman reporting to you live and direct from Kailua, Hawaii. Um, another beautiful winter day, clear and crisp and cool. Uh, great day for the beach. Got to come over here and be a tourist for a little while. Take off uh, some time from your hectic uh, snow-filled weekend. Anyway, for today's show, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the grid and specifically the grid and how it interfaces with transportation. Because I think most people don't realize that, you know, if we're going to go all electric with transportation, which is probably every expert you can talk to is telling you, we're going to go all electric to go green on transportation. But that requires an awful lot of upgrades to the utilities. And people don't think about that. Um, when I say an awful lot of upgrade, I'm talking that the generation will have to nearly double in most places. And that means also more high tension lines, more substations, more transformers and all that sort of thing. So if we, if we think about it, there are more than one kind of electric vehicle. Most people don't realize that. They're familiar with Tesla and all the other plug-in electric vehicles, Leafs, Nissan Leafs, and all the plug-in electrics that, they're, that are out there. But there's also hydrogen fuel cells. And hydrogen fuel cells um, suffer from one thing, lack of infrastructure that puts together and produces the hydrogen cleanly from clean energy so that we can power our, our vehicles with clean power. Because after all, if you're making your electricity from a coal-fired power plant or an oil-fired power plant with a big turbine, you're not being clean. You're charging your electric car with dirty energy. So if you're gonna be clean, the point is to be clean in your production of your electricity and then clean in the technology used to store your energy for your electric vehicle. And one of the things that people don't realize when we do talk about electric transportation and charging infrastructure on electric vehicles that run on batteries versus infrastructure to make hydrogen is you can make that infrastructure that, that uh, makes hydrogen, you can, you can run that off of your house. You could be making your own hydrogen for your car right in your carport if you buy small scale equipment. And you can also put large scale equipment right where the renewable energy is and not have to run power lines and transformers and all the other grid stuff that you need when you run your electric hydrogen vehicle off of hydrogen made from clean energy from solar, wind, or even hydroelectric. But you can make the hydrogen right next door. So anyway, today's guest is Chris McWinney. And one of the he's one of the first guys I ever really got together with to talk about electrolyzers and making hydrogen, making clean hydrogen, green hydrogen. And in fact, I was one of his first customers as well. And we still have the equipment that we bought and still operating out at Hickam Air Force Base. But Chris, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. But uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about some of the pluses of using your scalability of going you're, you're able to make fairly uh, small scale hydrogen stations compact on a pallet. They're like self-contained and they're scalable. So instead of spending four or $5 million to put in a big hydrogen station, you can put in a, a small station for shoot under $300,000 and it'll take care of a couple cars in your neighborhood. And then you can grow, you can, you can double the size of the station you can move that, that, that one station to another neighborhood and buy a bigger station if you're, all your neighbors end up having, you know, you end up having five or 10 or 20 cars in your neighborhood. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your equipment and how, that's, how that system works? Yeah, well, thanks for having me today, Stan. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, we envisioned a long time ago that being scalable and starting small and growing big would be a... Uh, Best, better way to um, a, a build hydrogen fueling infrastructure. So we started out in the beginning designing stacks for electrolyzers and uh, our own um, a fueling protocol and our own um, purification system and um, help design the compressors uh, to get them to do what they needed to do with our particular system and 
finding some that were low enough profile that they could be packaged together as one and um, put all of that plus storage into one package that's small enough that you can pick it up and move it around with a pallet jack uh, to start with. And um, then come on after that with three uh, other sizes that you can grow to as the demand picks up. And our key phrase that we use is dynamically matching supply with demand. So our products, they give us the opportunity to do that by, for instance, our Model 200 with some extra storage um, can handle um, uh, two cars a day in a 24-hour day, um, but conservatively, um, it could handle um, five cars a week. And uh, then you have, uh, when you get to the point where that is going to get overrun because there's a demand, then you can take that station and be able to move it someplace else without having to have an, an additional capital acquisition cost, just the cost of deinstalling it and reinstalling it, which with the Model 200 takes less than an hour to uninstall it and less than an hour to reinstall it someplace else. Um, and then that way you can open up new territories quicker and find those hot spots where it's going to be in demand that you have hydrogen fueling infrastructure. Um, and then replace the one that you took out and move someplace else with a, the next larger unit that the, that can then handle, um, you know, six cars a day or 20 a week or something like that. And then we have another model that we come on after that with that can handle, um, you know, make 64 kilograms a day. So it, it could it could handle up to 20 cars a day and. And, 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 you know, and, and so it's, it's it, every step of the way we have a, a, a station to grow with. And then once we get all of the stations uh, put out there, then the ultimate goal is to have large scale renewable uh, hydrogen from large utility scale wind farms and solar farms that we would um, put uh, our large electrolyzer on our megawatt scale. And then we would uh, truck hydrogen using hydrogen fuel cell semi trucks to haul that to all of our existing stations. And that's how we intend on building the transcontinental hydrogen highway. Okay. The image you have behind you there, that's Dubai, correct? Yep. That was uh, one of our um, wild and crazy ventures to the Middle East. And uh, it uh, that was fueling that uh, that trolley uh, trolley behind it has a plug power fuel cell in it, um, and it was uh, a, a range extender for the trolley. Okay, so the other thing that um, is an advantage with your equipment is your smaller scale units, and by smaller scale, I mean probably up to one that can handle uh, fifteen or twenty cars a week. Are considered appliances, correct? And that, like the refrigerator I'm trying to install at my house today, it's a, a 220 a, a volt uh, outlet and a water line from a reverse osmosis, you know, water purifier. And that's when you talk about install and deinstall and move it. It's basically disconnect the power, disconnect the water, um, get a forklift and move the move the unit to another site, connect the electricity and connect the water again. In fact, I'll tell you right now, installing your unit at the store at the station on Cook Street was a lot easier than installing my refrigerator today. So <laughs> I say, it isn't all that hard to install Chris's equipment. And, and I'm not a master plumber or anything. So um, it's it's actually pretty convenient. So it's it's nothing cosmic. And and he put all the work into the, the cosmic work into making his stations. They're basically a station on a pallet. And you know, when you think about it, that one pallet uh, replaces the oil field, the oil pipeline, the oil tanker that shipped it, the oil refinery that makes your gasoline and the truck that ships it to your, your station. And it's all right there on a pallet. And all you need is water and electricity and you have fuel for your vehicle. And I think that's an amazing clean way to go. And I think Chris's equipment is great, great to get you there. Can you tell us a little bit about your hydrogen highway plans? 
Yeah, um, so we plan on putting 27 stations in 27 cities from Los Angeles, California to New York, New, New York City, New York. And um, we're just going to start. We've already started that. Um, we've got three of those stations up. And we first built a what we call the um, Ohio Hydrogen Triangle. And it goes from Dayton, Ohio to Columbus, Ohio, and down to Portsmouth, Ohio, and back up to um, Dayton. And um, we've had that active now for about six to eight months, and we're running cars on them and um, just trying to gather data and information. And we're currently in the process of uh, upgrading our manufacturing facilities. And we bought new lasers and press brakes and injection mold machines and CNC machines and um, all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't know how to run. We have to hire people to figure that out. And um, we are uh, gearing up for uh, 250 uh, units per year uh, in manufacturing capacity. Um, and we are uh, first ones that are running through that. Right now we've got um, five Model 200s, two Model 342s, and um, Model uh, 2 of our 10,000 PSI stations that we're putting through that whole assembly process right now. And um, then when that's going to refine our production capacity, and then um, we're going to put that 27 order through, plus all kinds of other stuff that we've got going on. And um, then uh, that those 27 stations, then the first ones to branch out from Dayton uh, will be uh, an Indianapolis unit and an upgrade in our Columbus unit. So, uh, and then then we'll uh, start going east and west. And uh, but the ones that we're going to put in Dayton, we're going to put uh, three or four in Dayton before that step. And that's where we're going to figure out how our phone app is going to work uh, because um, one of the things that we've done in trying to figure out how to distribute a fuel, hydrogen fuel to people without running into log jams and not having enough product is um, we're putting together a phone app and you will become a member of a new company that we're developing called Emerald H2. And Emerald H2 will, uh, will give you uh, the um, G GPS coordinates for where a station is located and make sure that it has the fuel you need and that will allow you to reserve the gas until you get there. So no one pulls in and you might say, yeah, this station over here, the end of the road's got fuel right now, but if I don't get there in 45 minutes, somebody else might pull in and get it. You, that can't happen to you in this because you can reserve it until you can get there. And um, for a limited time, you know, we'll give you so much time to get there. But um, that will allow us to service uh, more people and provide them with hydrogen and not have to have as much hydrogen in store. Uh, so it saves on storage costs, uh, which is a pretty big expense in the hydrogen business. So, so you're going to uh, kind of uh, network out from Ohio east and west eventually once you start getting your uh, stations going? Right, right. But we want to gather off of these Dayton local stations where we can be Johnny on the spot and fix things and hammer out any other details that we need to know and make sure the customer experience is as good as it can possibly be and that the phone app's working right and it's giving us the correct data and our data acquisition systems are, you know, and storage of that data is, is, is proper so that that'll, that'll inform us uh, as we put these stations a hundred miles apart across the country, um, that's going to inform us of, you know, what station needs to go where, how much production it needs to do per day, how much storage it needs to have, all that kind of stuff. And are you working with car dealers so, so that the supply and the demand kind of match up as you start expanding your network? Right. We have a car dealer uh, that has one of our stations right now. And um, part of our uh, new website that we'll be launching soon with Emerald H2 and our phone app is all about um, uh, allowing people to tell us, hey, I see you're in uh, Denver, Colorado now with one of your stations. 
Um, I'm here south of town, you're north. When you get a station down here, we'll buy a car. So we, we'll know ahead of time um, who to get the cars to in order to make the demand uh, happen and be able to curtail and, 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 and you know, dovetail that demand into supply. And, and, and like I said earlier, um, dynamically match the supply and the demand. Right now, a lot of the dealerships, that, like the Toyota dealerships and the Hyundai dealerships that are making fuel cell production models, um, they're leasing their vehicles for like three years with fuel. So do you think that if they keep doing that, that kind of gives you the lead time to pick up used vehicles and get them integrated using your system and then eventually integrating the, uh, the, the brand new vehicles into your system as you build and build and build? Yeah, that's the, that's the idea. And um, to be able to, we'll also be offering free fuel with, our, with, the, with the offerings that we provide. Um, so uh, the idea is to, you know, create the demand by having the chicken and the egg at the same time. So we believe that the chicken is the car and, and the egg is the station. And the car moves around, so that's why it's a ch state. Uh, the, the chicken and the station is a stationary, never moves. That's why it's the egg. So if you can get the chicken and the egg in the same basket, you can have more chickens, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. So um, as you start building this network, um, there the cars, and, and so far we've we've got some experience in California with how these cars perform. Um, how do they seem to hold up over the first five or so, five or 10 years compared to internal combustion engine vehicles? Are they less maintenance? Are they, um, they hold up pretty well? Do they need a lot of care and feeding like, uh, like some fancy cars do? Well, I'm in contact with uh, four of them on a weekly basis uh, that I have. And then I have um, five others at other stations around the country um, that, we're in contact with, and they're all 2016, 2017s with somewhere between 25,000 and 35,000 miles on them. And everybody that I'm talking to is absolutely amazed at the mileage they get. And there's actually been some tests performed um, with both a battery car and the hydrogen car going down the road at exactly the same time, saying the same distance from each other, and then seeing how they perform. And the hydrogen fuel cell cars are outperforming the batteries and um, especially in some uh, graded terrain. Um, and uh, we're really amazed at how many miles per kilogram uh, we're getting. Um, and, uh, you know, you can take off and leave a place and say you have 100 miles of fuel left and you drive 20 miles, but you only used up. 15 miles worth of your fuel that it said you had. And it, it almost always ends up using less than what it says it was going to take to get there. So the performance is outstanding. Yeah, I noticed um, looking at the weather over in Ohio there, it, it's uh, definitely wintertime. Uh, in fact, you probably got a little bit of snow out there, maybe a couple of feet, in fact. Yeah. Um, how are the vehicles performing in, that, in the real cold weather this winter? Don't see any difference. It growls a little bit when it's cold until it warms up. You get a little um, sound. I think it's coming from the blower um, that, you know, when it's warming up, um, that blows oxygen and air into the one side of the fuel cell. Um, can't confirm that. Don't know for sure, but I haven't actually gotten out and looked, but you can definitely hear something when it's, when it's colder out, but then that quickly goes away within less than a minute. And then there's no difference in performance. Have you gotten any feedback from battery electric vehicle folks on how those vehicles perform in cold weather? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, you know, everybody knows that batteries don't like it when it's cold out. So uh, they they de uh, they deplete much faster when it's cold than they do um, when it's not. And of course, the fuel cell it doesn't know any difference. It uses the same amount of hydrogen either way. Yeah, I tell people, you know, I had a discussion with some Air Force guys one day and they were saying, oh, but in cold weather, the hydrogen fuel cell makes water and the water will freeze up and then it won't work. And I said, 
Well, I don't know. I've I've been in Alaska and and some and North Dakota in the middle of winter, and I don't think batteries work all that well. But did you realize that when a fuel cell makes that water, it's an exothermic reaction? It actually heats itself up. So once you start using it, once it's going, it actually has it gives off heat and warms itself up, um, just almost like an internal combustion engine car, except it's. Uh, doesn't doesn't make that much heat doesn't doesn't waste as much heat as uh internal combustion engine does but it does heat oh, up yeah. enough to keep itself warm yeah it's 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 warm it's warm water and um actually when you're going down the road if you follow a fuel cell car and you can see every so often it'll dump the water and it's got blowers and so uh it sits there and runs for a good while i've got one or two in my showroom um, and we start them up once a week and roll the tires so that the tires don't get, you know, while we're saving these for buyers. And, um, and you know, when you shut them off, they immediately purge all the water out of the system. And then there's a big fan that forces water out so that nothing can get in there and freeze. So they, they, the car companies have done a really good job of testing that out all out. And I don't see that as being a problem at all. Okay. So what are some of the other projects you're working on at uh, Millennium Rain? Um, I know you've got your electrolyzers really uh, going to town. I know you're working with the Navy on some projects and the Army on some projects, uh, and then with some of the other uh, hydrogen companies that have uh, fuel cells, and you're providing in the equipment to supply the hydrogen to their fuel cells. What are some of the interesting things going on with Millennium Rain? Yeah, tomorrow uh, we're going down to Plug Power to train them on a new 342 that they put in for uh, their uh, maintenance center and uh, decommissioning center that just happens to be 20 minutes from, from our headquarters. Um, it's a huge place, and it's amazing the work that they're doing there. Um, and so uh, that's a new system that we just put in. Uh, basically, it's a Model 300 without the external uh, shell. Um, and uh, then we've got the um, army units been up and running for a good while, and uh, we're just waiting on them to get back from COVID and that kind of thing. So um, we've got, uh, it. it's an amazing piece of equipment, our, which is our uh, M64, uh, produces 64 kilograms a day, and it's in a, a 10 foot container. So uh, 10 foot by eight foot by eight and a half foot tall. So. Um, it's a nice packaged system, and uh, we, th we, we have a lot of demand for that particular product. And then we're working on our megawatt scale um, system, getting just lots of, of calls and have done ridiculous millions of dollars worth of quotes from um, potential uh, megawatt utility scale uh, electrolyzer systems. That's going to be a huge market, and people are really figuring out that you can store uh, uh, hydrogen uh, for utilities, uh, solar and wind, um, at a much less cost uh, comparable to batteries. We actually have done a study through uh, a Department of Energy study that was done in 2017 out in Golden, Colorado, on uh, batteries. And they're saying that if uh, you have uh, uh, 300, uh, it's $380 a, a, a kilowatt uh, hour per storage, if you uh, can buy 60 megawatt hours worth of batteries. So that's a lot. I mean, you put a megawatt of, of power or storage in a battery in a 20 foot container so that'd be 20 60 foot containers to get that much and at that level we can do it for 99 dollars a kilowatt hour so about 73 percent less uh, than what batteries are but that doesn't eliminate batteries from the equation you still need to have batteries uh, to do the load leveling and to handle the big loads and to 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 make the grid stable from a, a standpoint of the Hertz cycles. So, but once you get enough batteries, then you can really uh, get a big savings by going to hydrogen and the world's catching on to that in a big way right now. Well, I think what's, what's finally they're catching on to is the fact that 
you could go with all battery plug-in vehicles and do 10% of the transportation, or you can go with hydrogen fuel cell battery vehicles and go to 80 or 90% of the transportation. Because, you know, they keep saying that there's economies of scale as we start producing more and more batteries. And that's true, right up to the point where supply and demand says you don't have enough lithium or you don't have enough cobalt or you don't have enough of the, the raw materials. And then all of a sudden your batteries start getting really expensive. So we can't be dumping all the batteries into vehicles that run on just batteries. We need to share those batteries with hydrogen fuel cell to make the batteries go further. And the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles do need a battery. I know in the Mirai, there's a traction battery and there's also a 12 volt battery. Right. Um, so they have two batteries in them that do two different things. But the fuel cell lets you use your natural resources wisely and extends the, them out to make your electric transportation market more viable and come along quicker than trying to just make battery plug-in vehicles all over the place. That's right. on top of the, the grid transmission, the grid and transmission, uh, generation and transmission issues that you have if you just convert to just plug-in electric vehicles where you have to put charging stations all over the place instead of a couple of uh, hydrogen stations centrally located near where you're making your power. Right, exactly. Right. Well, we've got about two minutes left. What, what are some of the really exciting things you're looking forward to in the couple, next couple of months? Well, I think the market is growing like crazy. I mean, I saw some reports where some very large electrolyzer companies in Europe are saying that they are sold out to 2026 and even as far out as 2030. One of them said they have as many as 800 deals in the, in the um uh, pipeline. And so, uh, you know, we are seeing the same thing happen. Uh, we do very little sales. As a matter of fact, I do zero sales. It just keeps coming our way <laughs> literally off of word of mouth, uh, from folks like you and, and, uh, blue planet and all our customers that, that we've had over the years. And, um, we just, uh, we're very thankful for that, and but we will be having a sales force, and uh, we're ready to go. And I think that we've learned from all of our customers uh, that we have about 18 different units in the field working all the time. That uh, the feedback that we get is people really love them, and they seem to always work. So, um, you know, as as a, as an inventor and founder of the company. That was my biggest concern, and uh, I think we're ready to get more aggressive and go out and really start uh, uh, letting people know that Millennium Rain Energy is ready to roll. Yeah, well, hopefully this show will help a little bit more, uh, Chris, and we'll have you on again in a few more months to get an update. And until then, hey, keep making what you're making because it is good equipment. I've used it. I've worked on it. I've maintained it. I've operated with it, and I've dispensed hydrogen from it. And it does what it says it's going to do, and it's like a Timex watch. It just keeps on ticking. Mm -hmm. So um, we appreciate the, the quality of work that you're putting out. And until next Tuesday, aloha, Chris, and Stan the Energy Man signing off from ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha.